Hi friends, welcome to the January episode of the Craft and Thrift podcast. Thanks so much for joining me as ever. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. So let's get stuck in. So in January, obviously it's we're still in lockdown here in the UK. Um, we actually went into a higher tier of lockdown here in Scotland just before Christmas, which means that my granny, who went down to visit my parents in England just before Christmas, um, is now currently stuck down there. Um, so I feel bad for her because obviously she's away from her home, but my parents' house is very comfortable and has a log burner and a garden, so uh, you know she's fine. Um, the benefit for me and Andrew and the puppies is that we have basically moved into her house for the whole of January. Thanks, Gran, if you're watching this. Um, she has a log burner and a garden, which are things that we don't have back in our hobbity hole, um, our one bed flat, which is currently where I'm filming. So it's really nice to have that little bit of extra space and it makes it easier to socially distance to exercise the dogs and things like that. So that sort of set the scene for my January, which has made sewing and knitting and things a little bit trickier obviously i've brought everything over to my grands with me um but it's just it's just hard when you're sitting in someone else's house right and you realize that you've run out of brown thread and you didn't bring any spare and your grand's got brown thread but it's not quite the right brown thread etc etc so it's things like that that are just little annoyances every day but it is what it is and we're very lucky and privileged to have the opportunity to have all this extra space um, and I'm lucky enough to still be working um, so yeah I lots to be thankful for definitely in this month's sewing section I thought we would touch on my favorite pattern of all time my true true and tested tried and tested I never know what TNT stands for tried and tested I assume my TNT pattern um, the Lou box top so hopefully I will work out how to put the picture maybe here or here. We're all still new to this uh, YouTubing thing. Um, but the Lou box top is a boxy t-shirt pattern made by Beth from Sew DIY Patterns. Um, it actually has quite a few different add-ons now. There's, I think, a sleeve expansion. There's a dress version. Um, but I've just got the basic pattern, the, the one that, um, that the pattern comes with, the original one. And if you've been following me on Instagram for a while, you'll have probably seen this top multiple times. <laughs> so sorry, not sorry. Uh, it is my one of my faves. So I kind of figured for the first proper episode of Craft and Thrift podcast, it was a good place to start. I've got a few of the ones that are currently in my wardrobe here, including uh, three that haven't yet made it onto Instagram. Or if they have, it's been in the last couple of weeks. Um, so yeah I thought it'd be a good opportunity to share partly because it's such a good pattern for me and if you've been following for a while it, you, you'll know that um, but also because I know January is a time where a lot of us are setting personal goals and maybe um, maybe you've got a sewing machine for Christmas um, maybe there's a small sewist in your life or a beginner sewist um, and I really do think this is a great pattern to start with I'm all for sewing basic things like cushion covers and hankies and and we'll get on to hankies later in the episode um but i do think for a beginner they can sometimes be a little bit boring it it depends on the kind of beginner sewist you're dealing with but i know for me personally when i started sewing i jumped right in with a pair of jean shorts um this was at secondary school in uh, home economics and everybody else made a wrap skirt, which was basically a, a rectangle of fabric with a tie on each end. And you would wrap it around your waist and tie it up. Uh, I went straight in with a pair of denim jean shorts, um, which bold choice, I would say, for, I don't know, 13, 14 year old who's just starting out and sewing. But I did finish them. I My mum helped me a lot, but I did finish them. Unfortunately, the first time I wore them out, I seem to remember they ripped up the back seam. Uh, and I never wore them again. Um, but I think my point is, 
not everybody wants to start at the basic end. Maybe you are getting into sewing because you saw an amazing dress on the Oscars and that's what you want to recreate. And that's fine. I'm not saying don't do that. But obviously there are there are easier projects to start with. Um, but on the spectrum of Oscars dress to square handkerchief, I think there's a lot of um, space to for people to, to pick their starting place, you know. And I think the beauty of some a pattern like the Lou box top is it's very beginner friendly, but you also get something quite functional at the end of it. So it's not like making hankies or scrunchies or, you know, tote bags or something where that might be useful for you. It might not be. And there's obviously always a benefit to creating for the sake of creating. Not everything we make has to be productive. But I think if you're making with a view to creating your own wardrobe, this is a great place to start because the patterns for jerseys and wovens, so you can kind of pick your um, pick your version depending on, on what you want to sew with. Um, it teaches you a lot of basic things like inserting a neckline, doing a buttonhole. Um, there's a lot of different versions so there's two different necklines and three different hemlines um so you get 12 is that right yeah so you get six different versions but then there's two different fabrics so that's 12 versions in total um so you get a lot of bang for your buck as well anyway this is starting to sound like uh beth is sponsoring me which she's not <laughs> i just love this this top so um i thought i'll start by showing you the new versions that i've made um this is the first one, hopefully you can see it. Um, it's just a bare, dead basic white t-shirt, which seems like kind of a boring thing to make, but actually I made this and instantly it's become one of those tops that literally I reach for the moment it comes out of, of the wash. Um, I added in one of the cute, I don't know if you can see that, is it gonna, uh, uh, trying to work out, there we go. Oh, I don't know if, it, there we go. Um, I added in one of the cute Stitch Collective labels, which I sell in the shop. Um, this one says 100% badass um, or size badass on the other side. And this is the crew neck cropped version, um, straight hem version, um, which is perfect because I've just started making high-waisted trousers. Um, and I think a cropped t-shirt looks really cute with a high-waisted trouser. Um, so that's version one. Version two, which is also relatively new to you guys you might oh i shouldn't say guys i'm sorry i'm trying to avoid using gendered language you folks um so you might have seen this one on instagram already depending on when this video comes out um but this one i made with fabric that i rehomed from marie of stitch odyssey um so if you were if you were following me on instagram back in september you, you'll see i bought about 36 kilos of fabric for the shop from marie when she was having a d stash sale and I took, I think, three cuts for myself, um, and this was one of them. Uh, so I love the burgundy stripe. Burgundy and white are both colours in my colour palette. Um, so this one is perfect for my colour palette, slotted right in. Um, it's got another Stitch Collective label, this time saying size me, once the camera catches up. There we go, size me. Um, and it's quite nice because it just helps denote the back as well. And again, it's the crew neck in the straight hem. Da, 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 da. Um, and I'll see if I can work out how to put in a picture of me wearing one of the loo box tops in one of these corners. Next up, this one has definitely been on Instagram recently. Um, this is again, same pattern again, but I've, this time I used it to salvage an old band t-shirt. So years and years ago, like back in 2005, I want to say, I went to a Ben Folds concert with my then boyfriend, now husband. Um, and it's one of the first concerts, like proper concerts that I remember going to. So I bought a t-shirt, Good Morning Sun, I Am A Bird, um, by Ben Folds. And I wore that t-shirt to literal death. So this was like back in the noughties when super tight, super short t-shirts were a thing. I don't know if anyone remembers that. And you would wear it with like an inch or two of midriff exposed. And then I wore it with quite low, low slung boot cut jeans that had butterflies and flowers up the legs. Um, but my best friends wore the same kind of T-shirt, but with those really wide leg grunge emo jeans. I don't know if anyone remembers them with the sort of studded belt slung across the hips. So, um, 
So yeah, we were really cool. Um, and I wore this t-shirt, yeah, literally to death because it was quite tight. It was like right up in the oxters. Um, and I'm a bit of a sweaty Betty and they just got kind of gross over time. And you know, it gets to the point where you, you just can't do anything with that. No amount of, of washing is going to deal with that. So I kind of rolled it up and shoved it in my fabric stash because I wasn't quite ready to get rid of it. And then I pulled it out recently and I thought, you know what? I could sew that on the front of a loo box top. So for this one, I cut out the front pattern pieces as normal. Um, and then I cut around the um, design on the t-shirt. And then I basically sewed the design onto the front pattern piece and then sewed up the rest of the pattern as I would normally. And I'm really pleased with how it's come out. Um, it's a little bit wrinkled. Um, I think it's stretched out different at a different rate to the, the actual t-shirt material. But it's fine. Like, it, you know, it is what it is. It doesn't need to be perfect. I'm just delighted that it's back in circulation and I can wear it again. And then I thought I'd show you this um, pattern in uh, woven as well. So obviously these three were all in Jersey. Um, I've also made it in woven. So this was a, I don't know what this is. Uh, it's definitely man-made, maybe a polyvisco, something like that, off cut that my bestie Victoria gave me years ago. And I made it into the woven. So this is the uh, crew neck version um, and the curved hem. Um, so it's it's quite a bit longer than the straight hem. Um, so I wear this either tucked into jeans or over the top of trousers. Um, I added the patch. Um, I didn't add the patch in on the jersey versions, but I added the patch on pocket on this one, um, partly because I thought it was a cute detail and partly because I worried that this looked a little bit like a scrub top otherwise. And I think the, the chest pocket helps elevate that. And then on the back, um, you can see with the woven version in the back collar, um, she has you do an open neckline um, and it gives you a sort of keyhole with a button and a rouleau loop. Um, and it gives you almost like a sort of keyhole design, um, which I quite like actually. It's quite a nice detail and it allows you to show off a elsewhere but it's basically it looks kind of like a Tudor rose um and I thrifted these I'm not even sure where from now I've had them for a long time and I've used one or two myself and then I handed the rest on to a friend so so they'll live again in a different on a different person's wardrobe and then the last one I wanted to show you um I made in this I think it's, it's a possibly a silk it was a remnant from Abacan in Manchester um and this is Technically, although it's a woven, I managed to get away with the jersey instructions for the neckline. So this one doesn't have the keyhole button neckline at the back um, because the fabric was quite drapey and there's a lot of ease in this pattern. So if you're not sure about fit, I would say you can probably get away with sizing down. Um, I've always made the extra small. It goes to extra, extra small. Um, I've always made the extra small but there's nine inches of ease in it so I suspect I would probably be able to get away with sizing down but I've never I've never bothered um but yes this was a lovely uh, remnant that I got from Abacan it's got this almost like kind of white cherry blossom almost style print on a green background the camera's not really doing a great job of picking up the green but it's quite emerald green um and that one's a really nice one that I've worn on nights out like hen do's and things like that um, and it looks quite smart for work as well, kind of tucked into smart trousers with like a blazer or something over the top. So that is my sewing update for January. I've actually got another loo box top on the table, um, which I can't show you because it's still a work in progress, and a grain line lark tee, um, both out of the same fabric. So I'm, I'm batch sewing them. Um, so hopefully I'll have them to show you next time. Um, but if you're new to sewing um, and you're looking for some inspiration um, or you are coming back to sewing. I know a lot of us are struggling a little bit with Sojo in January with lockdown and whatnot. I really would recommend this pattern. It's really accessible. There's a lot of ways you can, um, what's the word, like uh, customize it. Uh, and it's a really easy one. So if you just want a brain brainless make in front of Bridgerton or whatever, the loo box top has got you covered.
So for this month's sustainability episode, or part of the episode, I thought we would talk about hankies. Bit of an unglamorous subject um, and quite a sort of old fashioned thing, I think. When I was growing up, I associated hankies with like my grandparents, do you know? Um, but girls at school and things like that would use like those little packs of tissues um, or just at home, we would use just like blue roll to, to blow your nose if you needed to. Um, and alongside hankies, I thought we would also talk about paper towel or its counterpart, the napkin, which again, I, I think of as being a little bit of an old school thing. Like when you sit down for your sort of proper Sunday lunch, you would have a napkin. Or when you go out for a fancy restaurant, you would have a napkin. But I think this is one place in your house where a lot of us could make quite an easy sustainability switch. So instead of using paper towel or instead of using blue roll, um, you can use hankies or napkins and they don't need to be fancy. Do you know, we're not talking like super thick, heavy linen. Um, we're talking like cotton offcuts that you probably have in your stash right now. I feel a little bit hypocritical because in the first section we were talking about easy beginner patterns for um, people coming back to sewing or people who've lost their sojo or new new sewists and I was all like pshaw don't bother with napkins they're so they're so boring this is one place where I do think that it's such an easy quick make you could literally run off you know four of them in 20 minutes if you know what you're doing um and I think it's such an easy switch for a lot of us that we could make in our homes so you could stop buying the paper towel you could stop buying um little packets of tissues and instead use beautifully made um or not beautifully made mine are a bit shonk but they but they do the job do you know like you're blowing your nose in it at the end of the day or you're wiping your mouth like it doesn't need to be beautiful mitered edge corners it can just literally be a square of cotton that you've edge stitched so it doesn't unravel in the wash so to that end let me show you these are my napkins and these are my hankies um, and they're basically both made from recycled cotton. So this material I'm pretty certain was originally a duvet cover that I thrifted about 15 years ago when I was at university um, and I just I really liked the pattern. It's a sort of almost art deco, um, I don't know, flowers maybe? And some of them have a, a wider border with, uh, it's probably that way up, isn't it? There we go. Um, almost looks a little bit like snowdrops, I think. So I thrifted this years ago, sat in my stash for ages, and then I made a bunch of napkins out of it. I actually don't remember what I did with the rest of it because I don't have a single duvet's worth of napkins. But literally, all I did when I got my overlocker, um, see if the camera will show you, um, was I overlocked the edge and then I folded it down once and I did just a straight stitch all the way around. Um, so you can totally see the overlocked edge on the wrong side, but it does the job. Uh, these have been in circulation in my household for, I don't even know, over a decade. And they're totally fine. Like they've never fallen to pieces. Even staining wise, they don't tend to stain. So I don't know if that's something to do with the the cotton they've just not really picked up stains even after things like curry and things that are quite stained food um they might stain for one or two goes through the wash and then eventually the stain wears out but these are also our daily napkins so we literally use these for every meal at least one of us has one of these we often share because we're animals but it's i think it's a really practical easy way to ditch paper towel I guess the other reason you might use paper towel would be to clean up mess, but we have a pile of rags for that. So old towel material that I've cut up that um, I use for cleaning. So if I need to clean something that's been spilled, I would use the rags and then wash them. If I'd need to clean like my mouth while I'm eating, I would use the napkins. And personally, I think these are a lot prettier. So they go through the regular wash with everything else. So I know one of the environmental arguments for um washable things as opposed to disposable things is obviously they're not completely environmentally um sustainable because you do have to put energy into to washing them but i mean these are tiny like 
they just go in with the regular wash. I never do a specific wash just for the napkins, if that makes sense. They just go in with whatever else is in there. So I'm not doing any more laundry just because I use napkins, if that makes sense. I guess depending on the size of your family and how many napkins you have in circulation at any one time, that might be different to you for you, but your mileage may vary. I just think this is a this is an easy switch that a lot of us can make that can save you money as well. You know, paper towel ain't cheap. And if you're buying a pack of four every week or every month, you know, that soon adds up. I haven't bought paper towel ever in my adult life. I've always used either rags or napkins for things that you can use paper towel for. So there we go. Also a good way to use up your cotton scraps. For the hankies, same idea really. The hanky idea for me came about because Years and years ago, like maybe 15 years ago, I bought a wicker basket off eBay um, to make um, as part of a wedding present for a friend. And it came with a stash of vintage hankies inside it, weirdly. And I knew that they were in there. It wasn't a surprise. It was it was in the listing. Um, but they were really pretty and I, I kept them for a while. It was a bit weird, like someone else's hankies, do you know? Um, so from that point of view, I, I kept a few of them. I still have a couple in circulation. They're not here, but I still have a couple. Um, but most of them I, I recycled because I was like, mm, the idea of someone else's hankies is a little bit icky. But it, it kind of sowed that seed. That I was like, oh, they're really small and pretty and delicate. And like I say, up until this point for me, hankies have been associated with men. Like the men in my family had like big, white, like hankies that you would like whip out of a pocket to you know blow your nose with sort of thing and the women in my family never really carried these like my gran I remember growing up always had a little packet of tissues in her in her bag but it was the disposable type that came in a plastic wrap um so yeah I found these hankies and I thought that's an interesting idea and I squirreled it away and didn't think about it again for years and then just like most of us, you, you start sewing and you end up with lots of cotton off cuts. And after a while, I was like, you know what? I could just make a bunch of hankies out of these. So I just went through my stash and I pulled out anything that was the sort of size and um, that could be cut into a hanky, albeit this one. Um, I don't know if you can see is tiny little robots. And it's like the saddest size. It's literally like one nose blows worth of size. Um, but I just really loved the material and I couldn't get rid of it. So I've made that into a hanky. Um, and basically I use these to blow my nose and then I just stick them straight in the wash. Um, so I know the argument against hankies, especially in this Corona age, is that what you don't want to do is blow your nose, put it up your sleeve, carry it around all day, blow your nose again. You're kind of touching it, touching your face, you know, touching your sleeve, etc. That's a bit grim. For me personally, I tend to use them once, maybe twice, and then put them straight in the wash. Um, and I tend to carry two or three in every backpack that I've got with me as well. And again, once I've used them, I just put them in my bag. And as soon as I get home, I put them in the wash. So I guess it's not a perfect system. And I would say, obviously, in this Corona age, you need to be careful about washing your hands after using a hanky and you know, if you don't feel comfortable, especially when you're out and about and you would have to put it in your backpack, um, if you don't feel comfortable, then obviously use, you know, a, a throwawayable tissue maybe when you're out and about. But this is something that you could easily use in the house when you can literally blow your nose and stick it straight in the wash and then wash your hands. Um, and again, I've used these for years. I can't actually remember ever buying tissue like in the little packs of tissues because I've always just used hankies now. Um, and it's just a nice, easy swap that I think a lot of us could make and is a good way to use up your cotton um, stash. And if you're coming back to sewing or you're a beginner sewist, it's just a nice, simple project that actually has a function as well, do you know? So if you do decide to make your own fabric hankies or your own napkins, um, I would love to see. So send me a DM on Instagram um, at Craft and Thrift Shop or um, drop it into the comments below. Uh, I would love to see. I'd love to do a roundup maybe in a later episode of, of projects that other people have made after watching the sustainability section of the podcast.
for the small biz section this month I thought it would be quite a nice opportunity to go back and have a chat about how I came to start Craft and Thrift since it's the first full episode. I've got a cuppa because it's, it's quite chilly here today um, and yeah I thought it would just be a nice opportunity to for a little bit of history I guess of Craft and Thrift and how I came to to start selling online. So I've sold online in lots of different guises, basically my whole adult life. Um, started off with, just like most of us, you know, dribs and drabs on eBay, you know, old clothes and books I'd finished with and things like that. Um, and then I don't know if anyone remembers Live Journal back in the day, it was sort of early noughties, I guess. Um, Live Journal was like a blogging platform, I think it's still going. Um, but you needed to know a little bit of basic HTML to get it to work. Um, you could go as basic as you like, like some people, me in particular, would just make things bold or centred or underlined or whatever, but some people with the skills could make make their live journals look, look really fancy. Um, and there were quite a lot of communities on live journal. Um, I was in a sewing one called T-shirt surgery and there was another one um, called Thrift Store UK where people would sell old clothes, DVDs, jewellery, anything they'd made. So often people would sew things and sell them. Um, it was kind of like eBay, but without the bidding. So they would just list things with a certain price and you would pay it or not pay it. Um, and I got a little bit obsessed by this in, in my first couple of years of university. It was quite a thrill to sort of sell things I didn't want anymore, especially when you're a student, you don't have a huge amount of spare cash, albeit I would then use that money to buy more crap off of thrift stores, so it wasn't particularly money saving, to be honest. Um, but then I got quite into sewing around that same time, and I sewed a few things and sold them, just really basic, like pouches with Hello Kitty on, and in retrospect, I'm glad I didn't get into any copyright infringement issues there, um, cushion covers with hearts on, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was the thrill of selling, like the buzz of, of making something that someone would pay money for. Um, and also that recycling element of being able to use up things that otherwise wouldn't have been able to be used. Um, obviously some stuff I could have donated to charity, but there's some things that charity shops won't take, you know, like electronics or some charity shops won't take jewellery, that kind of thing. So it it depends. I mean, at the time, I wasn't that altruistic about it. I was a, a, a penniless student and, you know, every extra fiver was useful to me. So I, yeah, I whatever. I could have been definitely more ethical about it and I wasn't. But but it was quite a good experience in just the basics of selling online, like how to take good photos, um, how to charge for shipping, that kind of thing. So then later on, when I was at vet school, I set up an Etsy shop and in that shop I sold vintage clothing. So I would go around charity shops and buy vintage clothes and um, I was always looking for things with like vintage labels in, especially brands that you knew were old, like um, St. Michael's, if anyone remembers, that was like Marks and Spencer's brand, kind of pre-1990s. Um, and yeah, things with like fancy looking woven labels or things made in Scotland. Um, and I tried to focus on good quality. So like, you know, 100% wool or cashmere or whatever, and tried to avoid the stuff that was like acrylic or polyester. Um, and I did fairly well, to be honest. I bought some really bonkers stuff that, in retrospect, I'm surprised sold. But um, but yeah, it did fairly well. And again, it was a bit of pocket money just to kind of tide me over at vet school. Um, and then once I finished vet school, I was obviously busy learning how to be a vet in my first job. And, and it kind of fell by the wayside. And I can't really remember at what point I officially closed it down. But um, just got to a point where it wasn't worth the hassle anymore. But the seed was definitely sown and, and there was a tiny part of me that was always like, I'd love to go back to that at some point, especially buying from charity shops and I guess selling it on. It, it did feel like there was a certain element of recycling. I know the downside of that is that you're taking things out of circulation that maybe people on low income could use. And if you're watching this in America, that's I think that's certainly true of American thrift stores and Goodwill and places like that. Um, I would say over here, charity shops aren't really used in that way. I mean, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but 
I feel like charity shops aren't necessarily there to support people on low income because let's face it, places like Primark and H&M sell a vest top for a pound. Like even in a charity shop, you're unlikely to get something that cheap. So I think there's plenty of high street stores that sell things super cheap that if you're on low income, you can you can use them. I think of charity shops over here as more selling things to support that charity. So you're buying something to support cancer research or Marie Curie or whatever. Um, so from that point of view, I don't necessarily feel bad in retrospect for taking things out of circulation that that people on low income could have made use of. Um, I think more. I don't know. There's that ethical issue, isn't there, of like buying something from charity and selling it on like maybe that charity could have made use of those funds. But then it takes a certain amount of skill and expertise and time and equipment to sell things online. And a lot of charity shops don't have that. I think they're more and more going online, especially with Corona. Um, but but at the time in the early noughties, I suspect they were just glad to get the sale and didn't really massively care what happened to it after that and as a student if I could you know make five quid here and there selling something that I bought in a charity shop then you know to a certain extent who cares like the thing was being recycled the the money was going to charity and then I was getting a little bit of pocket money to help my way through university so I don't know if you feel differently feel free to pop a comment below I would love to have a discussion about it but um but yeah I think it is what it is right like ultimately if we're recycling and keeping items out of landfill then for me that's the ultimate aim but yeah so I enjoyed that that lasted for university and then once I started working as a vet I, that sort of fell by the wayside but I always wanted to come back to it and when I did eventually start Craft and Thrift, I think it was back in 2017 that I registered the name on Etsy. It was my Instagram handle at the time, or still is, obviously. Um, and I just kind of wanted to register it just to have it. I didn't really do anything with it for the first year or so. And then I was trying to think of all the issues that I'd had selling things online previously. And especially with the vintage clothing, one of the problems I've had was shipping so if you're selling like a light cotton t-shirt for example you might get away with charging less than three quid for shipping obviously you've got to factor in your time packaging it and the cost of the materials to package it but the actual price of sending a, a t-shirt through the post in the UK at least might only be a pound or two so if you add on a, an extra quid for your packaging and your time you're probably covering all of your costs the problem with the vintage clothing was the other end of the spectrum is like your big wool vintage cable knit extra extra large cardigan and that might that might cost quite a lot to sell you know that might go as a medium parcel for example and that might cost say five or six quid to sell plus your time plus your consumables so the problem i found on etsy was setting up accurate shipping profiles because you you want to make sure that you're making your money back on your shipping, at the very least covering your costs, plus a little bit extra for your time. But you don't want to be fleecing people and obviously high shipping costs puts people off. So it was a real balance to strike and I definitely got caught out several times, especially when people would buy things from places like Australia and I hadn't appreciated how expensive it would be. So I'd maybe somewhat arbitrarily picked a number out of my ass, basically. Um, and then someone from Australia had bought something and I'd been like, oh shit, now I'm like, you know, 20 quid out of pocket and the item only cost 25 quid and was it really worth it kind of thing. So when I came back to Etsy the second time for craft thrift, I thought I'm gonna pick something that is gonna be easy to post, something small, easy to package where they're fairly kind of fixed sizes so I'm not going to get into the whole like small medium large and having multiple profiles etc um but yeah so that that was my plan for that um so I picked vintage jewelry I thought jewelry brooches it's the kind of thing I can pick up fairly easily from again like charity shops auction houses estate sales eBay etc the problem is and I think this is key, I realise now, when you're selling online, is you have to care about what you're selling. Sounds kind of obvious, um, but I just wasn't that bothered about vintage jewellery. 
I didn't really know enough about it either, so obviously you need to know about your brands and your metals and your hallmarks and all that jazz. And I didn't really know, and I didn't really care enough to learn either, um, which is kind of key when you're doing this kind of business. You need to know your product inside and out, and you need to care and be passionate about it, otherwise you're gonna quickly lose interest. So I tried vintage brooches and I, I sold a few, but it just never really, like sparked joy for me. So I thought, what else can I sell that um, that is still kind of recycling, circular economy and all that, taking like already existing products out of circulation and kind of finding a new home for them in a way. Um, and I thought I'll make things out of vintage and secondhand fabric. So I can buy fabric from charity shops and car boot sales really easily. I'll sew things from them. So at this point I was like, right, I need a pattern that I can make that's my own design because I don't obviously want to step on anyone's toes um, using a pattern that's already like copyrighted. Um, I need it to be something simple that I can make to a professional standard that I can batch sew, um, that I can make quickly enough to make the time worthwhile. Because this is another problem when you're sewing or making anything to sell is by the time you're factoring in your time, you end up not really making much money out of it. And ultimately, underneath all of this, I want to make money. And I feel like money is quite a big topic, so I'm not going to get into that now, but it is something that I'm going to cover in a, in a future podcast because I feel like as a society, we're not very good at talking about money. And especially for things like small business, it's obviously key to staying afloat and staying in business, but also paying your mortgage and putting your dog on the French exchange and buying your terrier, new shoes, etc. So these things are important and ultimately I need to make money. So I was like, I need to make something that I can make quickly enough to charge appropriately for my time and make a profit on. I know, I'll make tea cozies. So I started making tea cozies and the whole time Andrew, my husband was like, you should just sell the fabric. You should just sell the fabric. And I was like, nah, I love sewing. This will be great. Like I can like batch sew five or 10 tea cozies in a day and it'll be great. And if I charge maybe like 20 or 30 quid for them, like even once you minus off like costs and whatnot, I'll still be able to charge appropriately for my time. Andrew's like, all right, but I think you should just sell the fabric. And I'm like, no, 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 you're totally wrong. Anyway, fast forward maybe six months. Turns out tea cozies, not that interesting to sew, um, not that passionate about them and nobody really bought them. So my fucking annoying husband still going, you should just sell the fabric. You should just sell the fabric. And I'm like, you know what? I really hate to admit this because you're going to hold this against me forever, but I think you're right. I think I should just sell the fabric. So I think it was like March, April, 2019, I bought this job lot of secondhand fabric and it was like a massive armful of it. Andrew has this hilarious video of me like, um, like with my arms, like scurrying around the shop, trying to trying to find the uh, the checkout before I fall. It all falls on the floor. So I bought this massive job lot and I put it on Etsy, and it sold really well. And when I say really well, like relatively speaking, I was probably selling maybe five or ten brooches a month, and I, maybe five brooches a month. Let's let's be realistic, and it jumped to maybe ten bits of fabric a month. So relatively speaking not a huge amount of sales but like it was double what i'd been selling previously if that makes sense so from that point of view i was like ah this is this is where it's at and from a making money point of view even better because obviously there's time spent sourcing the product assessing it cleaning it inventorying it etc but there isn't then time additionally spent cutting out sewing etc um, so you're kind of missing this whole block of time in the middle that you don't have to then factor in. Um, obviously, you still have to factor in the last third of photographing, listing, etc. But you'd have to do the first third and the last third regardless. But there's suddenly this middle third of creating the product didn't need to happen anymore, which is amazing. So obviously made it loads more efficient and loads easier to charge appropriately. Um, and fingers crossed in the longer term, loads easier to make a profit and you know, Scrooge McDuck roll around and my coins on the floor in my basement. So 
yeah so that's where we are today really so the plan going forward is to just keep doing what i'm doing so i'm trying to keep the inventory keep the inventory growing in the etsy shop um it's hard because people buy stuff which is obviously what they're supposed to do which is amazing um but there are definitely some weeks where people buy more than i can kind of physically list so i'm sort of trying to work out how to keep up with that demand and and keep the inventory growing to a certain extent etsy is a bit of a numbers game and the february podcast is going to cover more on um why Etsy for me. Um, but yeah, it is a bit of a numbers game. Obviously, when someone goes to Etsy and searches vintage fabric, I'm one of however many hundreds of thousands of hits. Um, so to a certain extent, having more inventory makes you more likely to to pop up in those searches. Um, but obviously, you also want good quality inventory with good quality photos and you know, accurate listings, etc. So there's a time element involved that I'm, I think there's going to come a point where I'm physically not going to be able to list more but i'm miles away from that i'm still working on my workflow um so that hopefully efficiency will only continue to improve as time goes on but yeah that's where we're at, at the moment i'm still trying to source regular fabric so i've bought job lots off the sewing community by the odd bit from charity but to be honest it's like one bit here and there it's not a significant enough um like a uh, stream to kind of rely on. Um, I've bought job lots off like Facebook Marketplace, Gumtree. Um, I've got a jobber guy in um, Glasgow who buys um, X warehouse stock, like ends of rolls of fabric and things like that. So I've bought a, a few bits from him. Um, I'm in the process of reaching out to uh, house clearance companies um, and I've bought a few bits from interior designers as well. So I'd like to, um, to reach out to more interior designers, albeit my last interior designer who I bought, I think three job lots from over about 18 months has recently closed because of COVID. So that sucks. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of trying to source regular, regular in, um, fabric input into the shop. Um, and that's kind of where we're at at the moment with craft and thrift. So I hope that little insight into the business was, interesting um and the history behind it was interesting um i would love to hear what you folks have to say if you've ever sold online or you run a small business i would love to to network with you so um feel free to drop a comment below um or pop over to instagram and and um, slide into my dms i think that's what the cool kids say these days um and i'd love to say hello In the self or personal section, I wanted to have a chat with you all about two things. A book, um, This Golden Fleece by uh, Esther Rutter, and a podcast fashioned by Clara Ampo and Amber Butchart. If we start with the book, um, so I borrowed this off a friend in the sewing community. So Helen Grossgrain Green, um, if you're watching this, full disclosure, um, this giant tea stain, I'm pretty certain wasn't me. I don't want to shop anyone because I'm pretty sure that you lent this to other people before me. Um, but I'm really sorry if it was me, but I'm reasonably positive it was in Scout's Honour. Um, so yeah, if you need me to, I'll buy you a new one. I'm real sorry. But yes, yeah, so my friend lent me this. Um, it's a journey through Britain's knitted history. Um, and it's a really interesting and quite gentle chat really um about uh, the history of britain kind of told through um items of sort of textile or knitted importance um so she's all over the country she goes to um uh 
uh, Shetland, uh, the borders of Scotland, uh, Wales, Northumberland, Yorkshire. Um, so it's really interesting from that point of view. There's a lot of parts of the country that I have personal connection to or, or find interesting in of themselves. So I really liked it from that point of view. Um, I also quite enjoy a, a book on history that's sort of told primarily through the eyes of women. Um, as we all know, history is basically the history of men. Um, and I don't really find sort of kings and wars and um, the feudal system particularly interesting. Um, I was a kid who dropped history basically as soon as I could at school. So um, I've only really become more interested in it again as an adult um, and mostly through podcasts and novels and things like that. Um, this is non-fiction, but um, I found it really interesting. It's set on, around a calendar year, so it's kind of roughly January to December. Um, and she travels the length and breadth of, of Britain um, and picks a significant kind of knitted item from each region that kind of represents that area. So, for example, there's a, a Gamzee from Guernsey um, and she knits it herself as well. So she knits her dad a Gamzee. Um, she knits a pair of um, colourwork socks, um, a Shetland scarf, um, a Viking Jorvik sock. Um, she knit her own um, bikini, which I thought was particularly impressive, and, and wore it to the beach, which is probably more than I would be brave enough to do. Um, she knits a pussy hat and goes on a, an anti-Trump march. Um, so, yeah, I, I found the, the history quite interesting. Um, and some of the items are kind of you know, like political or were sort of socially significant at the time. Um, and I find history told through the eyes of women I find a lot more interesting and, and um, I can kind of empathise and kind of understand more um, than told through the eyes of men. So I, I enjoyed that part of it as well. It's quite a gentle read. Like I tend to read before bed um, or first, first thing in the morning. And I so I tend to kind of gravitate towards things that aren't massively challenging. Like I, I like a good story, but I don't want to have nightmares <laughs> um, and I don't want to go to, to bed kind of um, after reading like, a page of non-fiction normally so I tend to stick to non-fiction um, audio books um, like ear reading I call it um, or um, or podcasts things like that and I tend to only read fiction in, in sort of book format um, but I would say this one was an exception because um, it is it's very well written it's very accessible and it is quite gentle so you can read one paragraph or you can read a whole chapter but um, you can kind of pick it up and put it down in that way which is nice yeah I would definitely recommend especially if you're interested in in knitting and textiles and history um, especially British history and, and you know covering places like Scotland which I obviously find interesting um, that is This Golden Fleece by Esther Rutter The second section of the self section, um, I wanted to have a chat with you all about a podcast I listened to recently. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts, um, mostly while I'm driving um, or while I'm doing housework um, or business stuff. Um, and this one I thought was particularly good. It was um, on Audible, which I, I hesitated to share it here because Audible is obviously a, a pay for subscription. Um, so you can only really access this podcast if you have an Audible subscription. So I'm really sorry if you don't. Um, but I thought this podcast was good enough that honestly, I would just subscribe for one month, listen to it and then 
cancel your subscription. With that subscription, you'll also get a free audiobook um, and access to all of Audible's other podcasts. And there are lots that are interesting. I've also listened to one on the dark web and one on the grown up guide to dinosaurs. Um, but I thought fashioned was worth talking about here because it's obviously a subject that we're all interested in. Um, so Amber Butchart and Clara Ampho present it and it's a history of fashion from kind of medieval times through till sort of 1960s. And they pick specific eras in time and talk about what was going on in society and how that was reflected in fashion. Um, Amber Butchart, you probably know from The Sewing Bee, she presented the kind of history behind um, some of the clothes that the sewing bees were making. Um, and she's on Tilly and the Buttons patterns as one of the models. She's the one with the, the sort of brightly coloured bob hair. Um, she's really well respected, I think, in the kind of history of fashion industry <laughs> academia um i'm pretty certain she has a phd um and she has a really interesting instagram so she's definitely worth following along on there as well um but she presents the sort of the facts part of it so she does the actual history parts um and then clara amfo kind of provides the sort of social context um so amber butchart will be talking about like 16th century dandies and Clara Ampho will cut in with like oh they sound like the Shoreditch hipsters of their time um so that's good it kind of gives you a bit of context helps you understand what they're talking about um I really like how it's presented as well they sort of bounce off each other quite nicely and I kind of want to be friends with both of them so if either of them are watching and you know want to slide into my Instagram DMs you you crack on love um but yeah, I thought it was really interesting insight into the periods of history that I don't really know a huge amount about. So there was one on um, women's um, liberation and the suffrage movement um, and talking about sort of culottes or early trousers and um, and how that was sort of reflecting what was going on in society with um, the women's right to vote and things like that. Um, and then there's another one on um, black culture and how that was sort of appropriated by white people and, and how that was reflected in fashion at the time and um, they talk about sort of black rights civil rights activists um, and yeah I thought that one was really interesting as well um, so yeah if you've got a spare moment and you fancy something entertaining while you're cleaning the toilet which is what I generally do um, I would definitely recommend Fashioned by Clara Ampho and Amber Butchart and you can get that on Audible Thanks so much for joining me in this first full length episode. Um, I'm so grateful that you've taken time out of your day to have a chat with me. Um, and I hope you found it interesting or useful in some way. If you have any feedback, I would love it if you could drop me a comment below um, or pop over to Instagram and chat with me over there. Um, feel free to like and subscribe and tell a friend. And um, once I get to 100 subscribers, I get my own url so rather than being backslash random stream of numbers and letters i get backslash craft and print shop which would obviously be quite satisfying um, and i'm about halfway there at the moment so um, if you're able to tell a friend or post on social media i would love that um, and i'll see you again next month Bye. Thanks so much for joining me on... Ugh.